Hello, friends. When I decided to do the Book Brilliant podcast, I made a list of people who I wanted to interview the most. And I kind of had a top three on that. And in my top three was Nikki Six from Motley Crue, Dog the Bounty Hunter, and Pastor Jack Deere. So today, I'm very thrilled to say that I had the chance to interview Pastor Jack Deere. Um, I was really nervous to interview him. He is uh, extremely intelligent, so intelligent that it makes you nervous to talk to him. And then you have the fact that he's a hero of mine, and uh, it really just compounds the nerves. Um, But one of the things that I told him before the show was that when I worked at a Budweiser wholesaler, I used to listen to um, his his, uh, sermons and interviews all day while I was counting beer. And so... Not only have I listened to hours worth of his content, I've probably listened to days worth. Uh, So I think the interview today is kind of funny because I got to ask a lot of the questions that I've always had with him. And um, he answered them, even though I'm sure that there were were probably uh, a few that he didn't really want to answer and was probably rolling his eyes at. But uh, he did answer them. He was was very polite. And um, it was just a great time uh, to be able to to talk to him. Um, I cannot believe how blessed I've been with the people that I get to interview. Um, I get to interview people that, I, I mean, people that I grew up paying attention to and watching and then when i've got them in front of me it's uh it's it's almost hard to well it's not that it's almost hard it does get hard to to talk to them sometimes because you don't even know where to start and so uh that's that's where the research and the meticulous notes comes in into play but even then you just it's it still can be a, a staggering feeling a shocking feeling um but Jack was uh, was very polite, and um, I cannot thank him enough uh, for doing this interview. And with that being said, there's actually uh, a whole nother layer to this of, of somebody else who I have to thank, and that is uh, the Sean Tabbitt Show. So I'm going to link all of his stuff um, in the show notes as well, because I literally have spent years trying to get into contact with Jack. And um, I couldn't get agents to get back to me. Um, I called up churches that I'd heard he was working at. Um, I couldn't get an email anyway. I mean, he was harder to contact than, uh, than a lot of the musicians that um, that I've uh, reached out to, which is kind of funny. Um, and I don't, think, I don't think Jack's doing that by design. It's just kind of chance, I guess. But um, the Sean Tabbitt show, I reached out to him and he was able to provide me with uh, the the missing piece of information that got me in contact with Jack. And I'll probably never forget, um, I, was, I was outside walking and I got this email back from Jack and I had to sit down when I got it because, not just because it was Jack emailing me back, I mean, that was cool, but it was more... It was just the, the realization that years and years of, of work of trying to get in, into contact with Jack and, you know, I, I would try for a while and then I couldn't, you know, wouldn't hear anything back and I'd be like, oh man, you know, that there was a, you know, just went down another rabbit hole and I would kind of give up for a little bit and uh, I, I decided I wanted to give it a run again and uh, thanks to the Sean Tabbitt show, I was able to get in contact with Jack. So so thank you for that. Again, hard work pays off and uh, this was that's another reason why it was so huge to have Jack on. So I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed having him on. All righty. Well, Jack, thank you for coming on today to the Book Brilliant Podcast. Uh, this is a huge honor to have you on. Thank you. Thanks, Matt. Glad to be here. No problem. So we'll start off. I got I got a stack of, of your books right here. Uh, <laughs> you know, when I, I started this website um, a few years ago, and when I started the podcast, there was three people who I wanted to interview. Uh, one of them is the bassist from Motley Crue, Nikki Six. Uh, the other one's Dog the Bounty Hunter. And then uh, Jack Deere, you're the other one. So uh, <laughs> it's huge to have you on. So <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Uh, I was going to tell you, so how I stumbled across you was I went to a, a really big church. Um, I, I grew up in the church. Um, it wasn't really until I was about 18 that I started taking the faith seriously. And um, I was in this big church and they had a bookstore. And um, I'd come across this book and it looked, 
it, it really looked like a book from the eighties surprised by the voice of God. And I'm like, man, that book looks kind of old. Um, but all I wanted to do at that point was understand how to communicate with God. Um, I wasn't sure what it meant to hear God's voice. I wasn't sure if it was audible, if it was a thought, how would I know if it was my thought or not? And so um, I picked this book up and um, I actually kind of forgot about it for a couple of years. Um, I, I found it one day in, in my library and I started reading through it and I was blown away um, right off the bat. And I actually felt guilty for waiting so long to read it. And um, I had no idea that this guy, Jack Deere, uh, was friends with John Wimber. And so growing up, John Wimber was a big deal in my house. And so um, I called up my dad and I was like, have you ever heard of Jack Deere? And my dad goes, um, yeah, I think I met him uh, once at, uh, I, I, he, he thought it was Healing 86. He's like, I, I might have met him because uh, my dad met John Wimber. And so growing up, I'd always heard the story about uh, my dad at this healing. And uh, there was a guy who was demon possessed and he was praying for him. And, and John Wimber had kind of come up and talked to him. And the story was pretty crazy. And so uh, my dad thinks he, he, you guys crossed paths that year. So um, at that point, I, uh, I, I found out that you had a memoir, you know, even in our darkness. Uh, so I checked that out. I read it in about two days. And um, as I was telling you beforehand, I, I just started listening to hours and hours um, of your sermons and interviews. Uh, so, again, that, that's kind of a, the background of how I stumbled across you. So, from All right. um, Jack, I wanted to ask you first things first. Do you ever kind of feel like the Christian Forrest Gump? <laughs> You, you've been kind of involved in all of the big things that uh, people study, the Vineyard Movement, the Kansas City Prophets, uh, Dallas Seminary. Um, you've been pretty blessed to be in, in a lot of uh, epic movements. Do you ever kind of stop and just think about that? I do. I just think about um, how amazing God is and what a sovereign plan he had. Um, I mean, I was never pursuing God. I was raised in a, in a, a, a really sick home. Yeah. And uh, had, had no thought of pursuing God. He came after me and to, uh, then sent a young life leader to disciple me who became my best friend, my big brother, my spiritual father, all rolled into one. And all I wanted to be was young life leader. I didn't, I didn't want to be a seminary professor. I didn't want to be a pastor. I had no idea I'd write books. Uh, and it just one thing after another just unfolded. I mean, at 17, I didn't know a single verse of scripture. At 27, I'm a professor of Old Testament exegesis and Semitic languages at Dallas Seminary. How does that happen in 10 years? You go from being biblically illiterate to being a professor of Hebrew. How, how does that happen? It's just, it was, God was just amazing in the way he orchestrated my life. And those kinds of things are just, are still happening in the healings I see. And it's just, uh, people I meet, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it really, it really is amazing. And I, I want to ask you a bit about Scott Manley. But before I do that, I was thinking, um, I was actually thought about this today. Um, whatever happened to your friend Bruce, who led you to Christ in the first place? I, I feel uh, like I might have heard you talk about that, but I can't remember. Yeah, Bruce, Bruce is, you know, my one smart friend. <laughs> he could talk about ideas and concepts. And when he was in the uh, sixth grade, he came to school wearing a, 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 a button to say to vote for Nixon. <laughs> and if Kennedy gets it, we'll all be ruined, you know. And yeah. I mean, he was at 12 years old, he was passionate about the presidential election. So he's just totally unusual. And uh, so if you had to pick one of us that was going to go into ministry, it would have been Bruce. But Bruce went into real estate, uh, did super well, still doing really well. Been, he's been walking with the Lord all these, uh, all these years. Yeah. Man, that's got to. Do, do you guys ever talk? Uh, do you ever. Not, not much anymore. Uh, we sort of we sort of went really separate ways. He kind of stayed in the uh, Baptist world, and I went into the Dallas Seminary uh, trajectory. I see. I see. Um, you know, Jack, one thing about your memoir, um, you know, it, it's not that it's a sad book, but I feel a lot when I read it, I almost feel like I've got tears welling up in my eyes for, for a, a lot of it. Um, and uh, if you actually were, were to go back and look at interviews I've done with rock stars, with all kinds of people, I always am recommending this book uh, to people. Um, and I, I think that for a lot of people with, who come from a broken home can really relate to it. Um, when I hear you talk about Scott Manley um, and his son and, and the way that he turns out, I literally wonder, 
could there have been some some kind of a curse on Scott? I mean, why? It, it just seemed like that guy lived through a lot of pain. It seemed like a good chunk of his life was in pain. Do you have you ever thought about that, or what explanation would is behind that? Well, I th- I think some of us do live with a lot of pain. That it's not necess- it's not a curse. It's just part of the way we uh, we walk. And he was so close to Scott was so close to the Lord, and such a great lover of God's people. I don't I don't think. Uh, I don't think that was a curse. I think that was the road that he was he, he was scheduled to go down. I mean, I never thought that we would lose a son to suicide. My father was a suicide. Um, I never ex- expected that that would happen in my family, and it did. And I don't think it was a curse. I don't. My my son got involved in drugs from the time he was thirteen and couldn't quit. I just yeah. think we, we all have different roads to walk, and there are different measures of of pain. And the one thing I do know about pain is make friends with it. Uh, because that that pain, that's what the author of Hebrews says in chapter 12, God disciplines every son and daughter he receives. So you make friends with that pain if you want to make friends with Jesus. And I uh, I say this, I think I said it in uh, even in our darkness. I've had pain I did not deserve. I've never had pain I did not need. Wow. Every ounce of that pain, if I let it, will take me to a deeper place in God. And I think that's the ultimate purpose of uh, pain. Oh, and, and by the way, uh, even in our darkness is not a book about pain. It's got pain in it. Some of my friends wouldn't read it because the title, even in our darkness, they, they, uh, I was surprised from one of my closest friends uh, a year after the book came out. Uh, I asked him what he thought of the book. And he goes, I didn't read the book. And I go, why do you read all my other books? You, you read all my other books. Why don't you read that book? And he goes, I just didn't want to read a book about Scott's death. You know, he knew Scott. And I said, that's not what the book is about. Yeah, the book yeah. is about becoming friends with God and how he'll use pain and every other thing in our life to bring us into that place of friendship. And, and we just gave that book the wrong title I'm, I'm, uh, because it made it sound like a grief book or a, a pain book. And people don't buy grief books. Uh, they got enough grief in their life without reading about someone else's grief. Um, yeah. So that was a, that was a mistake. Uh, but I don't think our pain's a curse. I don't think Scott Manley's pain was a curse. I, I think that was the road he was given to walk and he just walked it beautifully. Wow. That, um, yeah. And and I'll specify this too. When I say that, I feel like I've got tears in my eyes as I read it. It's not, it's not just be, it's, there's sad parts of the book, you know, obviously, but um, it just really, especially when I read it the first time um, I was in a place, I was a new father and um, you know, Jack, I'll be honest as I've got two boys, I've got a a three-year-old and um, I've got a boy that just turned one um, about 10 days ago. And um, I, I have, I'm terrified as a father. Sometimes I lay in bed at night and, and I, I try to not worry about my kids, but it's scary because th- th- I know that they're safe now. I can look at them in the crib. I can look at them in the room while they're asleep, but I can't protect them. And, and I, I, it's like, you know, who knows what, what's going to happen as they grow up. And, and that's been, that's been a fear I've been trying to work through. Um, I don't know if you, if you had ever felt that, but you know, when I was reading the book and and reading about your son, Scott, who, you know, had a beautiful personality, but, um, just had, had a rough road, had some things happen to him, had, had done some things in his life and then ultimately, uh, you know, a tragic ending. Um, but the way that the book is structured of, of how, uh, of just an unfiltered look at the Christian life, it really is. And it's beautiful how, you know, you're, you, you've overcome some things and, and just dove deeper into a relationship with Jesus. Yeah, that was an important part of the book for me. Uh, you say unfiltered, and I use the word unsanitized. Yes. yes. Yeah, I, I stood on a stage for years and told my best stories, <laughs> you know, the, the, the overcoming stories and that sort of thing. And I didn't realize what I was doing at the time, but I, I was presenting this version of myself that didn't really exist. Uh, this like super Christian version. And it was causing people who were listening to me to think, well, man, if, if that's what the Christian life is like, I, I don't really have a very authentic life. And it caused them to hide their sins instead of yeah. come out with them. So I wrote a book where I want to tell the real story. I want to tell the things I struggle with, to talk about sins that I've never talked about in, in public before. And, and when I do that on a stage, when I talk about my sins, I see hope by the Holy Spirit coming into uh, people's eyes. And um, when I read that book, even in our darkness, I cry too, but I don't cry over the painful parts. I cry over the part where I can't believe God was so good and he showed me 
is affection. I'm, I'm, uh, I've just rewritten the book, Surprised by the Voice of God. It's a brand new book. I think it's way better. And I can't tell you how many times I've cried reading over some of those stories of God's affection, of his of coming down and showing me how he loved, loved me or doing something spectacular uh, for me. Um, and that, that's the mistake we preachers make. We, we, we tell principles instead of stories of our experience of God's love. Yeah, I'll, um, th- that's one of the reasons I think why I like Rich Mullins so much. Do you remember Rich Mullins at all, the Christian musician? He wrote uh, Awesome God. Yeah, I never knew him. Yeah, so uh, th- th- he was always so genuine about where he was at. And, you know, I, look, I like Billy Graham a lot, but I don't ever feel like I'll be like Billy Graham. But when I hear Rich Mullins talk about the struggles and the sins and the, the anger that he thinks about or faces in his life, it feels a lot more like I can relate to that. And honestly, I, I've kind of felt that way um, w- with you as well. So um, w- when you're talking about Scott there, it kind of reminded me, I actually just preached uh, my first sermon um, a couple months ago, and I, I did it on uh, in, um, in uh, I'm going to say Philip. I, I jokingly said, uh, I jokingly called the, the chapter uh, Philippines, and now that's all, all I call it, but Philippians. <laughs> um, I, I did it on, on Philippians, and that's kind of what, what it's about is, uh, you, you know, Paul working through uh, some, of the, some of the pain that we have and how we can work through that, you know. Uh, th- that's a testimony in and of itself. Yep. Um, I, I want to ask you this, Jack. Is there anything that you see right now in the church that if you were 30 years old, you would want to be spearheading? any issues or anything that you see that maybe, maybe you don't, you're, you're starting to see it as a potential issue or concern, but you, you may not have the energy to, to do it right now, but um, anything that the church should maybe refocus on? Well, I, I think it's some corrections. I mean, uh, I, I think we should focus on friendship with God. And, and uh, often I'll go someplace and speak about being friends with Jesus, which means learning how to enjoy him and learning how to feel his pleasure in you. That's what, that's what friends do. That's why we have our best friend because of the pleasure it gives us to be with that person. And we also, uh, it also has this element of humility. Like I can't believe he wants to be my best friend. You know, that's the way we feel about our best friends. And so, uh, so that I never hear talked about in the church or rarely hear that talked about. So that's one thing I'd want to emphasize. The other thing is rewards. Uh, all of us, the most important appointment of all of our lives comes at the very end when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ and he makes an evaluation of our life. This is only believers go before the judgment seat. And uh, if we've lived well, then he's going to reward us. And that reward is going to stay with us for all eternity. Uh, And that's the day you want to be living for if you're really smart. You don't want to live for human applause right now. You don't want to chase that thing where I want to get a better performance so God will really like me. You want to be friends with him and live in a way that will give him bragging rights over us after we finish our life. And I don't hear those things talked about at all. The correction I'd like to bring in the, in the uh, church is uh, we need to be a prophetic church. A lot of the church is, is moving in prophecy, but some of it is really wild and there's like zero accountability. So in, in 2019, all these prophetic people and some of them really huge ministries yeah, uh, yeah. were running around saying that 2020 was going to be this great year of God's visitation and the salvations, et cetera, et cetera. And it turns out to be the, the pandemic and one of the worst years in, ever. Yeah. None of them are going back and apologizing. And yeah. they, it, it, there's, there's nothing wrong with getting something wrong prophetically and then apologizing about it. There's a lot wrong with getting something wrong and not apologizing. And that's one of the things that I would like like to uh, correct, because that just makes people think that, you know, what I thought before I started believing in the gifts, that all this prophetic stuff is just a bunch of bull. We're, we're, we're doing that when we, make, when we refuse to correct ourselves. Yeah. Um, you, you're right about the, the – I'll, I'll be honest. One of the things when I was in high school, what made me say, I'm going to be done with church and I'm going to – I'm going to go spend my time elsewhere was I was at a church and they had kind of did open mic uh, prophecy time. And a lady came up and was talking about how the end of the world was coming soon. And she felt that God was telling her to go tell people that. And I just remember thinking like, I don't, I don't know the Bible too well, but 
Um, one thing I was always freaked out about as a kid was the end of the world. And I knew in Matthew, it talks about, you know, nobody knows that time or place. And um, I was like, I'm done with this. And I would take, I would take shifts at work. So I didn't have to, you know, go with my parents um, on Sunday. And, and I had expressed my disgust with that uh, to my parents too. Um, and so I don't want the, the, the prophecy thing is, is something that I, I that's going to be one of the things I'm going to learn a lot more about because um, you know, you have stories in your book about how prophecy can help people. And I'll tell you right now, it would tremendously help my life if, if somebody was giving me, uh, some prophetic di direction. Um, but at this, and I don't want to discourage people from, from that, but there are some things where when it's blatantly, obviously against what the Bible says, that may not be a prophecy from God, you know? Um, so, Jack, I, I, I want to, uh, I do, I want to ask you this because it's been something that I've been um, thinking about for a while. What's the point of, what's the point of casting out demons and, and should that be something we do? Because I've had a couple different pastors tell me that, um, that if they, if they're talking to somebody who they think may, may be demonized, they're not going to tell them. They're just going to kind of go for a truth encounter rather than a power encounter and one person had told me, look, if I tell a guy, I think he's got a demon and he's got all these other problems, I'm only adding to his problems. So, you know, we'll just work it out with the truth. And I, I thought that that made sense for a while. And then I kind of stopped and I thought, well, then what was the point of casting demons out in the Bible? Surely there's a point to it. And so what, yeah, what the is the point? The Bible is really like a sticking point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I mean, you go back to <laughs> What we do ought to be what's in the Bible. And, and yeah. so how many truth encounters did Jesus have with demons? A lot. <laughs> well, they weren't truth encounters. He was casting them out. Well, okay, okay, yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. They Sorry, they yeah. Didn't call it, they didn't call it, they, they called it, I think if, I'm, if I remember the Bible right, they called it casting out demons. They didn't call it a truth encounter. The demons don't come to the truth anyway. And uh, so, so what if you lead a person to the truth? Now they know they got a demon. The demon's still there. Yeah. You, you cast out the, the demon. So uh, demons are in every other page of the Bible. And, um, it, and, I, and I came to the point in my life where I was a seminary professor, and I knew that. I read the Bible, but I'd never seen a demon. Yeah. And I thought, well, where'd they all go anyway? <laughs> I mean, may, maybe China or Africa, where people are superstitious or ignorant or poor or something like that. I, I didn't, didn't think there were any demons around me. And then when I started praying for the sick, we weren't, we weren't telling demons to leave. We were praying for the sick. And a demon would manifest because there was finally power on that person. I remember the first time we saw it happen, we were praying for a lady that had some illness. And a lady we'd known for a long time, been in our church for a long time. And, uh, and she goes, ah. and I go, what? And she said, something just ran across my chest. And I go, ran across your chest? And she goes, yeah. yeah. And I said, she said, yeah, there's something in, in me. And we ended up casting that uh, demon out. And, and if you pray for the sick as a way of life, not as like, once every couple of months when somebody in the church calls the elders and asks them to bring a prayer. But if you do it as a way of life, you're going to encounter demons. And the demons don't want to be revealed. They want to lie there hidden and, uh, and, and do their destructive work without anything bothering them. Uh, then, you, then you'll definitely get in the business of casting out demons. That's how it happened uh, to us. We've cast out, I mean, it's just a regular, it's a normal part of life if you're praying for the sick. And anybody can have a demon. So I'm in, I'm in the front of the Anaheim church. I'm praying for people. I'm head of the prayer team. I'm praying for somebody. And uh, he feels something stirring around him. Oh, he's, he's losing his life. He's got a disease that's causing him. Uh, uh, he's got diarrhea. It's all these complications. The doctors have said that this is a, a life-threatening thing. And he, nothing he's taken is working for it. So I'm praying for him. He feels something moving around him. And I go, ha, ah, now I know what that is. So I tell it to come out. And, and he goes through some physical manifestations the thing leaves him, all right? So then I go into automatic pilot. I'm not even thinking what I'm saying. I said, okay, you're, you're going to be healed. You're going to have the symptoms for about five or six weeks, um, and then they're going to gradually get better, and after six weeks, they'll be gone, and you'll be totally fine. And he was, he was the head of a super important ministry. That's all I'll say, but one that you would know if I mentioned it. And uh, so I don't see him. Uh, that's it. I never, heard, I never heard from him again, never saw him again. Four years later, I'm in the country where he lives, and I'm uh, and I and I call out a lady at the very back of the room 
with chronic diarrhea, something like that, you know, she comes forward and we pray for her. We're praying for a lot of other people at this conference. And then this guy comes up to me. This guy comes up and goes, do you remember me? And I go, I sure do. I go, how are you doing? He goes, man, it's amazing. Uh, you called out that lady. She has, ex- he's in my church. She has exactly the same thing I had. Um, but after you prayed for me, it was five or six weeks. I had the symptoms. Then they left and I've been totally fine ever since. That's typically how we end up casting out a demon. We're not looking for it. It just manifests because power comes on a person. Yeah. And it happens regularly. So, um, you know, so, so man, um, you know, I've been, I'm 27 years old. Um, I've, I've been uh, consistently going to church for probably 24 years out of my 27 years. Um, you know, like I said, took some time off in high school. Um, I've never seen anybody have a demon cast out. I've never seen a demon um, I've had some weird spiritual experiences. Um, you know, I, I grew up listening to stories of, about my dad, just tell these incredible stories. The one, when he was at Vineyard, uh, in the eighties, he said he, he turned around and a guy had growled at him. So he thought the guy might have a demon. So he brought him out in the hallway and he said, um, the guy, the guy immediately said, I know who you are. You're Ray Bechtel. You cast me out of somebody in Omaha. And oh, wow. my dad was out with you guys in California and was like, Whoa. And so he said he was praying on, he was praying for this guy. And then that's when he met Wimber, I think for the first time he said, Wimber came up and, and was like, all right, well, guys, we're wrapping it up, you know, come back tomorrow. And uh, my dad said, you know, when you would look in Wimber's eyes, it was just complete peace. I mean, it, it was, he, he thought it was incredible, but um, I, like I said, I've never even seen somebody get a demon cast out of them. And so over the past few years, as I'm reading the Bible, I'm just like, well, where did all the demons go? You know, yeah. Jesus goes to this small island and he's casting out all these demons. And I'm like, was it, was there just a lot of demons in an island or are there just that many demons on earth? And, you know, as I've asked these questions, I feel like I just kind of get redirected back to, well, it's better if we just kind of sidestep that and we work on their other issues. So mm. then it, that's kind of, and I've honestly, I've taken that advice for, for, couple of years but now i'm starting to say well then what was the point in the first place you know yeah. jesus was praying for healing when demons manifested or he was just giving a message and they manifested so power makes them manifest pray for the sick as a way of life and you will have demonic encounters i became a christian at 17 i did not see a demon in anyone until i was 40 years old but i didn't start praying for people to be well until i was almost 40 and once I started doing that, that's when I started seeing demons. Oh, and during that, during those, uh, all those years from the time I, from 17 to 40, I'm a uh, pastor of a church, a young life leader, and a seminary professor. Yeah. So I'm doing all those things, but I don't see any demonic power because there's no power in my life to make one manifest. Yeah. Well, uh, man, I... <laughs> I, I'm a layman as far as all this goes. I'm not, I'm not college educated. You know, I, I'm just somebody who I want a good relationship with God. I want good relationships with people and I want to follow his commands as best as I can. And I think that, you know, with, with miracles and with, with demons and healing, there's a little bit of spiritual adventure there. And I think we're all longing for, for some adventure. And I guess where I come at is, is it's like with what you're talking about with rewards is it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to be face to face with God and, and see that I left this whole area of, of people who are wounded and, and sick in this capacity. And um, I did nothing about it. And so, you know, my question with, with whether it's demons and healing and all that is it's like, look, I, I want to live the Christian life that God wants me to live. And I don't, I, I feel like I'm going to Sunday, you know, going to, to a church and, and listening to, you know, your personal relationship with Jesus, like, Hey, that's great, but I think there's more out there than that. And so um, that's kind of where I've been wandering around trying to figure out what am I supposed to be doing, I guess. I don't know. I think, I think the answer to that is not to try to figure out what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, the, the answer is, is to focus on being friends with Jesus. I, I don't use the word. I used to talk about be, having an intimate relationship with Jesus or a personal relationship. I don't do that anymore because that's not the language he uses. The language he uses is John 15, 15, I no longer call you servants, but friends. It's not like the service is over, uh, but the emphasis is going to be on friends. You're you're friends who serve me, not servants that I occasionally talk to. We're friends and, and 
and I'm going to give you power to uh, serve me out of that friendship. So when I make the goal of my life to enjoy Jesus, to feel his affection, like every, I get up in the morning and I, I start my day by saying, Father, would you grant me uh, grace today to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength, and my neighbor is myself. And would you show me your beauty today? Let my friendship with Jesus grow. I get up and pray. At the very beginning, I start praying something like that. And since I made friendship with Jesus like the focal point, uh, I have gotten, I've, I've had more time with him, more like supernatural, um, more experience of his affection than ever, uh, ever before. So that, that, so in a sense, kind of put ministry in second place, enjoying Jesus in first place, and it'll, it'll dramatic, it dramatically changes everyone's life who does that. Yeah, uh, that, that's one thing my, my dad's told me, too, is he said, when you start praying for people, especially if you're out and about, you know, you'll start encountering it then. Um, you've said that um, home groups are, are, a, are a big point for that. I've, I've heard that as well. Um, again, my, da- my dad said the same thing, that um, a lot of his stories were at a home group where they'd be sharing and my dad would start feeling an impression that like, uh, this guy's got something going on and start praying for him. And then he would cough and you'd smell sulfur or something, you know? So, um, that's one thing that I, I, I think, um, COVID, well, my wife and I, we started going to, uh, um, those house groups and then COVID kind of shut that down. So as things open back up, that's actually a, a point in my life that I want to go to is make sure that I I'm involved in that with my church. Um, uh, Jack, I wanted to ask you too. So I, I think a lot of people who have come from the background where they would consider it maybe more charismatic, but we're, we're healing the casting out of demons prophecy for people who have had a bad experience with that. Do you, do you have any advice for people like that who want nothing to do with the miracle spiritual side of the faith? Do you have any advice or any, any direction you'd point them to? Well, I don't think we want to let our bad experiences determine the course of our life. Yeah. I mean, let, let's say we ate, ate some really bad food at a restaurant and we got food poisoning. Okay, so we don't ever go to a restaurant again? <laughs> is that yeah. it? I mean, you have a bad experience, so you want to avoid all of that? Uh, th- and there is a lot of craziness going on in the church. I mean, I'm, I mean I've, I've seen more craziness than the average person who's turned off by the guests. I guarantee you I've seen a lot more than they have because I've been there. I've been in that uh uh, church. So I, I'd say abuse is just part of the deal. So, you, you know, Paul was was correcting the abuse of grace. So what's the answer? We're just not going to be great. We're just not going to be grace oriented anymore. Yeah. Really? Is that really the answer? And he was correcting the abuse of the gift of tongues in Corinth. Yeah. And, and w- what was his message? Pursue the spiritual gifts earnestly, especially prophecy. And, and the, the gift that can Next to tongues, the gift that can be the most abused gift in the church is prophecy. But after correcting all that abuse in Corinth, he comes down to chapter 14, verse 1, and says, earnestly pursue spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. Why are we supposed to pursue spiritual gifts? Because they are the tools of love with which the Holy Spirit builds the church. Yeah. I mean, it's nice to go to the hospital and set up with someone who's sick. I mean, that's... Really nice of you. Be better to take a gift of healing for that person. That would be a little bit fuller expression of love or a prophetic word of encouragement or something like that. The gifts are empowered love. Pursue them, and especially the gift of prophecy, because prophecy is probably the most common supernatural revelation of God's love. When people are prophesied over in our conferences, uh, I mean, th- they feel so loved and that they so appreciate the guidance and, and so on. Yeah, that's good, man. That, that, that's really good. Um, I wanted to ask you, you know, I, I want to take a step. I want to take a step back here and I want to ask you some stuff about, um, you know, w- w- with John Wimber. Um, w- w- when you guys were in the midst of, of I would, I'll say your peak, y- you know, um, as, as you guys were growing and expanding on the church, what were were you guys spiritually attacked? I mean, what, what, what's that like? Because I've always felt like, honestly, w- when I've prayed for people or led people to the Lord, it's like, I can fully expect that that night as I lay down in bed, you know, I've had where my bed's shake, uh, you know, started shaking. 
um, pretty, pretty minor stuff, but like still things where I'm like, huh, you know, that, like I can kind of point to, to where that came from. Uh, was that like everyday life for you guys at that time? Or did that just start to become a rare occurrence? Um, so it was different for John and than it was for me. Um, John um, was one of the most powerful people I've ever seen. The greatest leader I've ever seen probably the only person I know whom I could say he was a prophet to the nations. He, he changed more churches over the world than any other person I've ever known. Um, his pain came from the constant abuse that, that was hurled at him outside the church. Yeah, he yeah. was the most uh, loved and hated pastor of the 20th century. Conservative evangelicals said the worst things about him, how you know he was leading the church to be demonized. He was you know, just on and on and on. I got fired from Dallas Seminary, not because of my theology change, but because I was friends with Wimber. That's what the president of Dallas Seminary told me. Uh, I, he gave me a choice of giving up my friendship with Wimber or resigning from the seminary. And I said, well, I'm not resigning from the seminary. I'm a good professor. I got high ratings. I haven't done anything wrong. Um, and I'm not giving up my friendship with Wimber. And he said, well, then we'll fire you. And uh, I said, okay, then fire me. But don't try to get me to take responsibility for what you want to do. And, and so that, I, I was fired from my friendship. That, that's how m- much people hated him and how threatened they were by him. Is Some people were withholding contributions from Dallas Seminary because one of their professors was friends with John Wimber. <laughs> so that's the kind of abuse he accepted uh, it, all the time. And the Lord told him at the beginning, when power first started to come on, he goes, do not reply to your critics. I will raise up people to defend you, but never try to defend yourself. And the whole time I knew John, I never saw him offer one single public word of defense. And I never, and I, I, I never really heard him complain about all the abuse. But Carol, his wife, told me, she said, Jack, he, it hurts him because she sees him at home when nobody else does. Yeah. And the things they were saying about him really hurt him. That was that was his cross. That was what he, he bore um, for, for walking with the Lord in power. My temptation was different. Mine was pride. I, uh, you know, and that's always been my temptation. You know, I became a professor at a really early age, and I was in a seminary where we told our students, we're the best seminary in the whole world. Our doctrine's the best. We're the best teachers in the whole world. And I just joined right in with that crowd and said, yeah, sure, this is the best place in the, uh, in the world. That's always been my temptation. So my temptation when I'm walking into the room with Wimber is to feel like, Hey, I'm awesome. I'm really spiritual. That's why I'm with this guy. And I'm (laughs) leading against the spirit now. And I'm seeing people healed. That was what kind of like the, the the stumbling ground for me. It wasn't so much uh, the persecution. Uh, In fact, I had too much pride to even feel the persecution very much. Um, That, that was, that's what's caught. That's what's caused me to stumble and what's hurt my friendship. I think with God more than anything else is, feeling superior with people. And I was pretty old uh, in God before I knew that was a bad feeling. Wow. What, what was that like when, when Charismatic Chaos or the other one, I think was Strange Fire by MacArthur, when those books came out, what was that like? Because you and, Mac- you and MacArthur, I thought either were friends or maybe still are friends. I'm not exactly sure. Um, w- weren't you and MacArthur friends? No, we- no, we were never we were never friends. We were in the same crowd, that conservative evangelical. Okay. Crowd. And he once gave a lecture at uh, at Dallas Seminary. Um, I got to guard my tongue here, um, um, so I don't want to do what John does, <laughs> what, my, what MacArthur does. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I uh, when charismatic chaos came out, I read it. Um, he accused me of not knowing what the gospel was. And I went to his office and uh, a, a, a seminary student in, in uh, Sydney, Australia, said he had a conversation with me. And I said that I didn't know what the gospel was. The guy, that was not true. And, and in fact, at that conference, I defined the gospel in my workshop. It was on tape. Uh, but these guys printed that in a bulletin, which was really juicy. You know, Dal Sim, former Dallas Seminary professor come, has become a charismatic, doesn't even know what the gospel is now. Just, just what we said would happen. Well, so MacArthur prints that. So I go to his office and I said, um, John, I, I thought you might want to talk to the 
former seminary professor that doesn't know what the gospel is. Would you like to ask me a question or two about the gospel? And he put his head down. He goes, I knew I shouldn't have done that without talking to you. And so I, I think ah, this is fantastic. That's a, the response of humility and all that. And, you know, so I state what the gospel is. Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins in your place. Um, if you trust him to forgive you and give you new life, he will come into your heart and never leave. And MacArthur was just really apologetic. And, and uh, I, I said, John, John Wimber looks up to you. He, he esteems you as a, as a significant teacher of the Bible. He goes, yeah, but John, John lets people, uh, sp- more than one person speak in tongues. He lets people all over the audience speak in tongues. And he had sent some of his guys in with recorders in their briefcase. We knew where they were from because they all came in with suits, <laughs> wearing suits to a vineyard church. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, there are a couple thousand people there, but they stood out like sore thumbs. And so I leaned over and said, hey, there's some John MacArthur's guys. And they all had briefcases, so we knew he had recorders in the deal. And so, so John hits me with that. He goes, he goes, Wimber lets people, more than one or two people speak in tongues. And I go, yeah, no, I, I said, no services. And he goes, you just let that go on? And I said, John, I'm called to serve Wimber. I'm not his boss. He's my boss. I don't get to tell him what to do. And he's got four of his guys sitting in the room, and he looks at those guys. Oh, yeah, that's right. Because <laughs> he didn't expect those guys to tell him what to do. Yeah. Uh, that's so I said, but that's a correction you could give him. I, I agree with you on this one, but you could give him that correction. If you called him and asked him for lunch, he would meet you in a heartbeat because of his esteem for you. And you could help bring some correction to some of the things that you see you're wrong. Now, some of the things we would just disagree on, but we want to be friends. We don't want to be enemies. We don't. And he goes, OK, and, and, and acted like he was going to call John. The next week, he mocks me and John from the pulpit. Wow. That's my experience with John MacArthur. Total true experience. Didn't exaggerate any of that. That, that you know what um my dad for christmas last year he had asked for uh, macarthur's book uh, i think it was called why government can't save you and so i i was like hey i'm gonna buy you this book charismatic chaos too because i want you to read it because i had read it too and i read the parts where he talked about you and i was like man these are kind of weird criticism kind of shocking i guess i it was things that i didn't think that he would have said and so um my dad's like look i'll read the book but if he says anything bad about wimber you know i i just i don't think i'll believe it and so my dad read the book i said what'd you think and he just said he didn't know wimber these people don't know wimber you know you can take first of all i don't know if any of us have perfect theology and you can always take something out of context or take something that somebody may not be correct on but my dad ultimately was like he doesn't know john wimber and and didn't really think much of the book outside of that so um, I didn't know if that was like a major blow to the church at the time, if it flipped your world upside down at all, or if it was just another attack from another pastor. No, Zondervan published my book right after that. Yeah. Which had some fairly cogent criticisms of, yeah, yeah, surprised by the power clip. <laughs> that was yep. published in 93. It was Zondervan's best year that, that came out in November. It was Zondervan's best selling month in the whole history of the company. And that was their best-selling book. Yeah. And MacArthur was so mad when he read the book, he said, I'm not going to publish another book with Zondervan, which wow. I, don't, I don't think that broke the hearts of the people at Zondervan, as far as I can tell. <laughs> man, oh, man. I'm not quoting anybody there, but. Yeah, of course, of course. Man, that, that's, that's tough. That, that's, um, that's really tough, and that's unfortunate. Here's, here's a random one that I've never heard that. Uh, I've never heard anybody bring up to you, but I wanted to ask, did you ever have any interaction or ever meet Lonnie Frisbee? I did. I did. I don't know what to think about that, that the, the taking psychedelics and having these experiences with God. What do you have a take on that at all? Or any stories that you could share about with Lonnie Frisbee? Well, it it wasn't just a drug issue. He's also uh, homosexual. He, He also struggled with homosexual issues. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the, the spiritual gifts aren't given as character rewards, right? They're, they're gifts. They're given. And wow. our character can be totally different. And, and uh, the, the greatest prophetic person that I ever knew was Paul Cain. And it, and it turned out Paul Cain's the most corrupt person I've ever known. Uh, I have a, I've just written, rewritten Surprised by the Voice of God. And, and it's, a, it's a 80, maybe at least 80% new book. And I have a chapter on uh, uh, true prophets, carnal prophets, 
and false prophets. And I put Paul Cain in that chapter, and I talked about his power, but the, the lack of ho- any kind, reasonably, anything that could be called holiness was just not in his life. He lived, he lived a double life from the time I knew him. He lied to me from our very first meeting. Um, but yet he had the most amazing prophetic gift I've ever seen, better than, what, better than the stories I've heard about Lonnie Frisbee. Uh, Lonnie didn't just have uh, power in his life. Lonnie could point at a group of mockers and they would fall down. I mean, I heard those kind of stories, just, uh, uh, just amazing. And by the time I met him, he was soft-spoken, broken, uh, kind of at the end of his life, um, and, and was really gentle. Um, uh, Paul Cain was corrupt. He never repented, as far as I can tell. Yeah, I mean he's he's died. Paul Cain is, is dead now, but um, it, it, but we tried to confront him. His three spiritual sons tried to confront him, and he would never repent. So the, the fact that people have power in their life is n- no sign that they have a holy uh, life or a good life. And it's not even really a sign that they know God. I mean, Jesus said, in the last days, many people will come to me and say, this is in Matthew 7, didn't we do miracles in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out demons in your name? And I will say, depart from me, you worker, you workers of lawlessness or iniquity. I never knew you. Yeah. So here he's talking about people that move in these miracles. And he says, I never knew you. And somebody goes, well, yeah, those are false prophets. They were using the devil's power. No, they weren't using the devil's power. They were using God's power. They were using Jesus' power. The devil can't cast out the devil, Jesus said. The devil will never do that. These guys Jesus is talking about, were cat, they were using the Lord's power to cast out demons, to prophesy and do miracles. But he says, uh, I never knew you. you yeah, it, yeah. It can't enter, it's clearly, he means, they're not going into heaven. He says in that passage, they're not entering heaven. So there's a class of people that know how to use the Lord's power to even do miracles, but they don't know him. They're not going to be in heaven. And, I, and, he, and, and the Lord said, many people will say to me, and I, I don't think I've seen many people yet, but I think before it's all over, there's going to be a whole major release of people running around doing stuff in the Lord's name that don't know the Lord. That's a really good explanation of that. I've never really heard anybody kind of explain how someone like Ronnie Frisbee could do what he, what he does. It yeah. kind of makes me feel better in the sense, too, that gifts aren't just on character. Sorry, what okay. were you going to say? So I think you can make it, there, you, you could make a case that Paul Cain did not know the Lord. And that there's a number of reasons for that. I put him in the book. And I, I'm agnostic on whether Paul actually knew the Lord. Or I think Lonnie knew the Lord. I think Lonnie was a born again believer who yeah. got trapped in. Uh, in a sin. And that happens all the time. There are a lot of born again believers that, that practice sexual immorality or that are get involved in drugs or alcohol. So, uh, from my, from everything I heard about Lonnie and from my own contact with him, I, I felt the spirit of the Lord in him. I felt like he's a true, uh, believer who got trapped in a sin that he couldn't get out of. Yeah. Um, I, I want to, I'm going to start bringing up some books here in a second, but before I do that, before I forget, have you heard any of these stories about Jesus appearing to people in Afghanistan right now? I know that this is completely random, but I'll forget if I don't ask it now. Um, I had somebody tell me who's a missionary that they're starting to hear some stories that uh, Jesus is, is actually manifested and helped some Christians escape over there. Have you by chance heard any of that? I've heard those stories for years, and I and I believe them. I, uh, I've especially have heard lots of stories of him appearing to Muslim people in a dream, and that ended up ends up converting them. That's yeah. been going on. And I, I started hearing those things twenty at least twenty years ago. I think it's true. I think he is doing that. Yeah, that, that's that's great. So you know, on a, some book recommendations, Jack. Um, on our website, people will be able to find um, all of all of your books. This whole stack I got right next to me. Um, on Wimber's books, I've got, uh, I've got in front of me, I've got the dynamics of spiritual growth, PowerPoints and power evangelism. Uh, do you have a favorite book by Wimber by chance? Well, I like, I like everything he did. I like his stories. Uh, but power evangelism is probably the most famous book that he did where he introduces people to the fact that you really can have spiritual power in your life, that the yeah. God's doing all these things again. And, and the thing that m- makes Wimber so great is he tells great stories instead of just, it's, it's not a theory that he has. He's telling you the actual stories of what happened. Yeah. 
I, I had heard Wimber once say that he has read like 3000 books on, you know, miracles, uh, spiritual gifts, uh, demons, whatever. Um, are there books that you would recommend if, if somebody, let, let's say me, for example, we'll just use me, um, healing, casting out demons, um, prophecy so far, it's all been pretty theoretical, you know, in, in my walk with the faith. And so I'm somebody who I want to get in and do the stuff as Wimber would say, um, for, for people who want to get in and do the stuff, uh, first of all, you know, read the Bible. What other books would you recommend? And is there, what else would you recommend they do to be involved in that? I think more important than any book you read, it, reading a book is great. Um, but more important than reading any book is being in a community that's actually pursuing the gifts of the Spirit. Yeah. God, God can raise up a John the Baptist, a Samuel, who's not, you know, not actually part of a community. They just have this sovereign gift. John Paul Jackson was like that. Did you ever hear that name? John Paul Jackson? That, that kind of sounds familiar. He was one of the, quote, Kansas City prophets. Okay, yes. <laughs> yeah. Paul Kane. Bob Jones, and John Paul Jackson. Yes. John Paul Jackson was like one of the most amazing prophetic people I've ever seen. He, and it happened to him. It's, he started getting prophetic things when he was five or six years old. They just came to him. He, 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 see, he has a vision of his next-door neighbor dying, yeah. little Johnny in a car wreck. Goes in and tells mom, his mom, Johnny's dead. And mom says, no, no, look, Johnny's right out there. Pulls the curtain back. He's playing. Two weeks later, he's killed in a car wreck, exactly like John Paul's. So John Paul didn't pray for prophecy. He wasn't in a community that believed in prophecy. He just had this sovereign gift that came on him, like John the Baptist had just called out, or Samuel's called out as a little kid, David out in the fields guarding uh, sheep. So that does happen, but it's not the normal way that people learn to move in the gifts of spirit. They don't learn by reading a book. They learn by being in a community that's pursuing the gifts of the spirit, and people are failing in front of each other. They're trying to hear God's voice. And they're failing. If you're not failing, you're not learning, right? I mean, yeah. what golfer learns if they don't fail? Yeah. And, and not just fail, you fail a lot before you get really good. So that's where you actually learn. Uh, you, know, you can read all the how-to books in the world, but you get in that community and you're practicing. And the other thing to pray for, uh, as opposed to pray for a book to read, is pray for a coach. Yeah. But I didn't even know to pray for a coach, and, and God sent me John Wimber. Just, he was amazing. Uh, I, I didn't know what it was like to hear the voice in your in your head until I started hanging out with Wimber and he started explaining how these impressions come and how they could be so gentle you just totally miss them if you weren't paying attention and 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 so on uh, and then watching him do it so that that's what you want you want uh, a community that's practicing and you want a, you want a coach uh, hopefully out of that community God will raise up a coach for you yeah that that's great that's that's good stuff. Um, I, I think, um, again, I, man, that, that was a good quote about, again, that, that um, character does not necessarily define the, the level of gifts that you have because... Yeah, here's, the way to, here's the way to say it. Gifts are not awards for character. There we G go. Gifts, gifts are, are not awards for character. Yeah. Gifts are given. They're not earned. Yeah. I, I think it makes some people nervous to see the guy who it's like, that's, that's the healing guy and that's the prophecy guy because I think uh, as humans, we have a... We have a tendency to, you know, make fanfare out of out of people, and that's where it can kind of get abused. So, Samson's uh, probably the best illustration of that. There's a guy who had great power, but so little character. Yes, and it was God's power. It wasn't the devil's power. Yeah, yeah that that's good. Um, I wanted to ask you: Are you familiar with uh, Neil T. Anderson at all? Neil Anderson. Uh, I met Neil when he was still at Fuller Seminary and was just kind of learning the gifts of the Spirit. And, and was with Peter Wagner, uh, that whole crowd was kind of indebted to Wimber. Wimber was like the one they were following that was kind of opening the doors for them. Okay, yeah. I've got, I've got the Peter Wagner book. Uh, uh, again, this will all be linked on our website, uh, Super, Supernatural Forces and Spiritual Warfare. And I only bought it because I saw John, <laughs> John Wimber was on it. But um, Neil's got a, he's got a memoir that came out a, a couple of years ago, Rough Road to Freedom. And uh, the bondage breaker, of course. Um, he, he's I, I do I really like his stuff. So I kind of always wondered if you guys were either friends or knew each other at all. Well, yeah, we were in the same circles for a while, but you know we sort of diverged, not not in the same circles anymore. 
but uh, yeah. you know, I always liked him. That, that, that's awesome. Um, what about uh, Smith Wigglesworth? Were you ever interested in, in him at all? Or, or well, I read all that stuff about him. <clears throat> what was I that? Think, I read a ton of stuff about him. I think uh, he had the real, real, he was the real deal. Yeah. He was Pentecostal through and through, um, but it doesn't make any difference. I, I mean, I, I'm not a Pentecostal in my theology, but I mean, he had great, great healing power. Yeah, th this book right here uh, changed my life in a couple ways. The, the the secret of his power. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. I, can, I um, read a ton of books about him. I, I, I may yeah. have. Read I gave away my whole library a few years ago, <laughs> <laughs> and I gave away a ton of those kinds of books. I, I bet. Well, when I, this was a, this was my dad's book. I stole from him actually. But uh, um, I remember when I was like four years old, my dad told me about Smith Wigglesworth woke up and the devil was in his room, and he just went back to bed. And I think my dad meant for that story to be comforting, but instead it just terrified me. And I was afraid that every day that I woke up that the devil might be in my room. But, um, but this book really uh, had an impact on I me. I think he said, I think the story was he woke up and there was the devil and Smith Wigglesworth said, oh, it's only you. And then he went, you. And he went back to bed. That might be apocryphal. It might've really happened, but you don't, by the time those kind of things are written, Smith's been gone, Wigglesworth has been gone for a long time. Oh yeah. So, you don't know if they're really true because there, there is a problem of like, you know, magnifying our heroes a little bit, making good stories better. Um, but but he, uh, but he definitely had the power. He also had some really idiosyncratic things like hitting guys in the stomach yep. to get them healed or knock a demon out or something like that. Yeah, I don't think he hit women in the stomach, but he definitely hit some guys in the stomach. Yeah, man, um, that, that I've got his uh, the complete collection of his, of his life teachings here as well. Um, I've heard I've heard more people talking about um, honestly in the past few years, I've heard people bag on Smith Wigglesworth, Derek Prince. And then I've started to see uh, some people kind of creep in there with criticisms of John Wimber. All three guys are dead. They can't defend themselves. And um, I don't know, you know, Smith Wigglesworth, that's 1800s. Derek Prince, I've got honestly a lot of his stuff. There's been some stuff I've read from him that I'm, I guess I'm not sure about. But um, again, you know, when it comes to Wimber, there's guys like you who knew Wimber, the guys that are walking around who can say no, that, you know, that you can't call him a charlatan or whatever. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know. Have you by chance, did you ever read this? I don't know if you were a part of this. I haven't read it yet, but it was called The Quest for the Radical Middle. And it, do you have any, have you ever read it or have any thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah that was written by a vineyard guy who was on the outside. Okay. Not on the inside. Yeah, so some of the stories, that I, I would disagree with his version of some of the stories. He had to get them from other people because he wasn't there. I was on the inside during that whole time. I, I sat in the room when world leaders from different places were, had come over to see Wimber. I was sitting in the room and heard the conversation. I was at all the conferences, usually uh, uh, speaking at the conferences and doing workshops as well. Um, so it's like, if they, if you weren't there, okay, you, you know, you're getting reports from somebody else and, um, and there's some value to that, but it's not the same thing as an eyewitness. Yeah, that that's funny. Did you, have you by chance, did you ever come across uh, Walter Martin, the Bible answer man? Did you ever have any relationships with him? I can't, I, I had, not with him, but with his uh, successor. Yeah. Uh, I can't even remember his name now. I can't think. Did he, was his successor, did, did he go to like the Christian Orthodox or, or something like that? Or was that somebody, I thought somebody who was a part of that group went to the Christian Orthodox. I could be wrong. Yeah, I can't remember. I mean, I had a number of run-ins with, with the, the guy. He, he was, you know, claiming I said things I didn't say. Oh, really? And, <laughs> yeah. When I called him, say, I never said that. He goes, you know, I should have called you first. But I had to, I had like two or three of those kind of things where he didn't, he never did call me to find out if they were true. He was so sure that, that Wimber was a detriment to the church that it's like, okay, if this is wrong, it's all right. If I'm, what I'm saying is wrong, it's still okay because we know Wimber's a bad guy anyway. They're, they're, they're critics like that. Yeah. That's, see, that's messed up. I'll tell you one thing about Walter Martin was his daughter has a story, and um, I, haven't, I haven't finished the book, but um, she put this story, I guess, in the book where he was with the guy who – I don't know, maybe he was Reformed Baptist or Baptist, I have no idea, but didn't believe in, in uh, demons or anything like that or its power today. 
and um, ended up having some traumatic event where they cast a demon out of a guy. And like, and as they're in the elevator, the guy was like, what was that? And I guess Walter Martin was like, that's what you don't believe in. <laughs> you know, um, there, there's been a book that I came across uh, recently and read called God's Devil by uh, Erwin Lutzer. And I don't I don't know if you've ever read this, but it kind of oh. shaped it, it, it's it's a good book because it really clicked in my head that that Satan is a servant to God. Yeah. It's not as if it's some chess match where God's sitting there like worrying what Satan going to do next and trying to overcome it. Right. Uh, you know, um, I, I think that that book kind of clearly puts it into uh, puts it into a perspective of, of um, you know, how much of a servant uh, Satan is. What, what if I, I know that um, Mir or C.S. Lewis and the screw tape letters, that was, that was impactful for you. Uh, have there been any other books that, um, have just been really powerful for you along the way, or do you have books that you recommend to people? Oh, I get, um, oh yeah. Um, I'll tell you a book I recommend for everybody is Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology. There we go. Uh, yeah. If you read that book, you don't need to go to a uh, seminary. <laughs> I mean, wow. read it, study it, learn its contents. And that's what you basically would learn in, in seminary. And Wayne's a great writer, crystal clear. A uh, solid theologian believes in the gifts of the spirit. Um, I'm sort of into. I'm, I'm more into. Oh, oh, I know a book. Holy, I can't believe. Um, Craig Keener. Craig Keener. That sounds really. He, he is, he is a New Testament professor at Asbury Seminary. A total genius. Uh, I, I can't. I mean, I don't know how anybody could write as many books as he's written, uh, and and at the scholarly level at which he's written. He's written a two-volume work on yes. miracles. Yes. It's unbelievable. It's 1,172 pages. Yeah. The bibliography is 165 pages of fine print. Um, and he's cataloged reliable reports of miracles all over the world from the last 20 centuries. And what makes it unusual is a huge amount of his stories come from the physicians. They were either used in the miracle themselves or witnessed it. And I just got his newest book. Just one second. Uh, that, that book, uh, that two-volume work on miracles could be a little in, in, intimidating because it's you know, written in an academic style. Yeah. This is his newest one, Miracles Today. Yeah. And uh, it's, it's written in a popular style. It's phenomenal. I, I would totally recommend anything Keener writes is good. Uh, but sometimes it's pretty, it's academic or, you know, he's got a four volume commentary on X. Yeah. Not, not little volumes, great big volumes, four of them. I, that's like a lifetime work. And it's like one of 30 books he's written. So he's just, he's totally amazing. Yeah. I've heard you recommend that book a few times. I know Dr. John White was another. He's ultimately who kind of changed your life, right, Dr. Yeah, John right, right. Yeah, he's he's been in heaven for a while now. Yeah, and I've heard you quote uh, J.I. Packer, or, or no, actually, in some in um in surprised by the power, you had quoted uh, J.I. Packer. Um, do you have a favorite uh, book by Packer at all? No, not really. I mean, I I don't read too much of the. Yeah. <laughs> I don't read too much of conservative evangelical theology anymore. It's just kind of so much of it is repetitive. It's what everybody's saying. And uh, I, mean, I mean, that's not to say nobody else should read it, but that's the world I come out of. You know, I kind of, yeah. th th those, so it's, it's not a high level interest. I, I read classics all the time. I, I read Shakespeare. I reread C.S. Lewis, uh, Dante. I love, I don't know. I, I, I read, uh, you know, reread his magnificent three volume work, uh, yeah. probably every year. Um, so I just, I, I like the classics. I, I, they, they feed my soul. I, I love people who are beautiful. Oh, I, I'll tell you, this is not a Christian or I'm not, it's not, not a Christian guy, but if you want to be a writer, read Rick Bragg all over, but the shouting, huh? That's his memoir. He's a Pulitzer prize winner. He, 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 wrote an article on the Kansas City bombing in 1994, okay. uh, and he won the Pulitzer Prize for it. He was raised dirt poor in Alabama, alcoholic father, left the family. Uh, so he's got no future at all, ends up squeaking into college, becomes a, he's a voracious reader, becomes a writer, 
And the New York Times and the LA Times get in a bidding war over him. And New York Times uh, wins. It's called All Over But the Shouting. So he's got lines like this. I'll just tell you one line. I could, I could quote a bunch, but I'll just tell you one. All right. So if you or I were writing, we might write a sentence like this. Um, it can be difficult reliving some of our childhood memories. All right. Yeah. Here's what he says. Dreaming backwards is like walking into a dark room lined with razor blades. Ooh, can you just feel that sliver? You just slit your back. I mean, it just that's the way he writes. I mean, he is like this, this, um, the way he sees the world and all that. He's like, that, that's if you want to be a writer, and he's not a believer, uh, at least not by his admission, he's not. Um, yeah. And he's in his 60s now, and he's still writing. Uh, Rick Bragg, all over but the shout. And that's a must, in my opinion, for anybody who wants to write. Wow. I'm going to put that uh, uh, again, that all this will be in, in the show notes there. You know, if you're looking for something that's a little bit out of the ordinary, um, I'll tell you what, I don't know if, if you've ever heard of Michael, Dr. Michael Heiser, um, but this, yeah, th this book, uh, Demons, I started reading this and, and it's different than any, anything else I've, I've ever read. Um, Heiser is, Heiser is very interesting. So when you go back and you read the classics. When you're reading Heiser. And, and you're reading something he says about demons or all that, just ask yourself, where is this in the Bible? Yeah. Well, what biblical principle supports this. That's one of when there's probably no more foolishness in writing today than in the writing about demons. Yeah. And the second one would be prophecy. That would be where you see so much foolishness written. But demons number one, hands down. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna pause to ask you this question. And I thought about asking it to you offline, but in Billy Graham's book about angels, um, he talks about how he had started writing a book about demons and he actually stopped because he thought, you know what, there's there's enough of this out there. I want to talk about the other side. I've thought about, I write down book ideas of books I want to write all the time. Some of them are good ideas. Maybe one or two end up being good. Uh, some of them are, are, most of them are bad ideas. Maybe one or two are good. Um, I had thought about doing one called um where did all the demons go and, and you said that word for word earlier which was funny and i've thought about doing some kind of a study almost like a uh, journalistic but extremely principled in in um in the bible maybe talking about historically talking about you know what missionaries see versus what the united states sees and churches uh, otherwise do you think that a book like that is even necessary or do you think that there's probably enough out there that going on that adventure has already been done well i i don't know and i and i'm not sure that the stuff we write should be necessary i mean uh, i mean does the world need one more memoir i wrote a <laughs> memoir but do we, do we really need another one um uh, I, I think it's more like uh what, what's in your heart to write you know and how you feel led by the lord um, so if, if, if you write a book on demons, just make sure that what you say is in scripture, that you can, you can support it with scripture because so much of the stuff that's written about the demonic world is not supportable in scripture or it's antithetical to scripture. Yeah. Well, I, back in like 2010, you, I heard you do a sermon where you had said, somebody had asked you kind of a question about a book on demons and you said, you need something that's a combination of scriptural testimony wedded with experience and yeah. um you had kind of talked about how most books are are anecdotal either they're 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 from yeah. people on the outside they're not from anybody who's ever done it and so my idea behind my book would be kind of that the answer that i've been asking myself for years which is where did all the demons go and you know what the heck's going on or, or, or what's our call here are we supposed to ignore it have truth encounters or are we supposed to have power encounters i mean what <laughs> you know what's how should the church operate now in this day and age where you can prove anything on a phone? I mean, all you got to do is you don't have to wonder anymore. You can just Google it off of your phone at any given moment and you know the answer. So I, I don't know. That's been something that, that, um, that I've thought about. Um, before I let you go, I wanted to ask you, are you by chance a fan of Hemingway? For some reason, you've always pegged me as a Hemingway guy. <laughs> Well, his writing, yeah, not of his person. <laughs> yeah, not he, of his he was, writing. As far as I can tell, he was a major jerk. Oh, uh, really? In real life, yeah. But as a but as a writer, yeah, he he changed the course of, of the novel in America. Yeah, Actually, I guess I never heard he was a jerk. I um, 
but uh, that, that's kind of interesting. Did you I, have- I'm, uh, and I'm not talking about what I've read about him. I'm talking about his own words when he's writing, telling stories about himself. <laughs> I mean, he's an egomaniac and uh, just, uh, and, and the way he criticizes, I mean, he turns on his friends, um, you know, mocks them in his writings. I mean, uh, yeah. You know, I heard a, I read a story once about him or him and another author were arguing and uh, Hemingway had pulled his, his shirt down and said that he had more chest hair than the other guy. And they're standing there showing their chest hair to each other. And then they just got into a fist fight in some office. <laughs> Heming- Hemingway was famous for fist fights. Uh, yeah. there's, a, there's a good book, uh, not a good book, a movie I like called Midnight in Paris. Uh-huh. And uh, it's a story where this modern writer is in Paris and uh, he gets he ends up going back in time to when Hemingway and Faulkner and all those other guys were in, uh, in Paris at the same time. It's pretty remarkable. And that shows you some of Hemingway's character wanting to get in fist fights and all that. I'll have, to, I'll have to check that out. There's a book I haven't read, but it's called everyone behaves badly. And it's about the, the true story that led to his first novel, because I guess his first book was pretty much just, uh, the truth. I mean, he just kind of had changed people's names to to make it fictional. But yeah, well, uh, Jack, you, you've uh, you've been on long enough. I, I really appreciate it. I want to let you go and, and enjoy your day and enjoy your family. Um, again, I really appreciate you uh, taking the time to to do this interview. It really does mean a lot to me. Thanks, Matt. It's great being with you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thanks. Bye bye. We'll see you. Well, again, everyone, thank you for listening. Uh, huge thanks, obviously, again to Jack for taking the time uh, to interview me and put up with all of my questions and uh, being so polite about it. Check out all of Jack's books. They're all going to be linked. Uh, if you go to bookbrilliant.com, you'll be able to see every book that we referenced and uh, you will be able to uh, get them in the click of a button. And uh, Jack is not really active on social media. He does have a Facebook page. Um, If you are really wanting to follow him and stay up to date, I would suggest checking the pages out because I'm sure in the future when when he releases more, they'll probably... um, you know, be a little bit, uh, they'll probably post it on their social media, I would imagine. Um, and, I, and I'm hoping to have Jack uh, back on, hopefully in uh, in a couple months, maybe a few months, who knows. Um, but uh, we talked about him coming back on, which is obviously huge for me. So again, Jack, thank you for your time. And thank you to everybody who listened.